1984, 18-year-old Sarah fell into a coma after a horrific car accident. For 20 years, she slept and doctors said she'd never wake up. Then in 2005, something extraordinary happened. Up Highway 96, commonly nicknamed the State Fair Freeway, beyond the cliché of wheat fields and right-to-life signs, take a left on 23rd Avenue and you'll find a nursing facility where something bad happened. Defied reasoning. Resisted complex science. World's smartest minds couldn't explain it. Sarah's been brain damaged, blank, mute, and immobile for nearly 20 years. She couldn't talk to visitors, no channel changing, can't say quiet, couldn't say itch. Sarah was hit by a drunk driver 20 years ago, sending her into the path of a second car that smacked her forehead. No one knows how her body survived, let alone her mind. Sarah, they didn't know as she lay in bed, mouth gaping, face miserable, in mute anguish, body atrophying, feet gnarling, fists gripped across her chest, tight as if she were terrified, large blue eyes staring out like she was trapped. While she slept, her brain was healing. The world turned. Sarah got older, others younger. Some gave up and left as Sarah Scantlin lay in bed. She never thought she'd do more than lie there and stare into oblivion, or wherever brain-damaged people go, between now and then, nowhere and somewhere. Sarah returned after six months. Sarah uttered, What's it like to spend 19 years in a nursing home, silent for 17 and yelling for three? Sarah Scantlin has spent the past 20 years vacillating between life and death, but she's now fully and totally awake. She underwent surgery on her long, unused limbs in February, after emerging from a coma-like state that had kept her motionless and speechless for 20 years. Since then, she's undergone extensive speech therapy to free her long, dormant tongue. Now, though she seems to be in a coma, her chats show that she was aware of many of the events occurring around her. Her father asked her what she remembered about incidents that had happened years before soon, after she'd woken up. He inquires, Sarah, what's 9-11? Bad fire, airplanes, building, hurt people she replies. Sarah still struggles to move, and she still doesn't talk in complete phrases, but according to her family, the Sarah who abandoned them on a dreadful night in 1984 after a hit-and-run accident left her, who was 18 at the time, in a semi-conscious state, is still alive. Sarah's family claims that she made the most of every minute, almost as if she knew that her life would be cut short. According to her father, Jim Scantlin, she adored life from the very first breath, she grew up in the 1980s and led a dance team in college after being a high school cheerleader. After a summer that saw the United States win the Los Angeles Games and Ronald Reagan nominated for a second term, fall officially began on Friday, February 21st, and as that evening turned into Saturday a.m., Sarah Scantlin left a party at a nearby bar without realizing that a harsh new reality was speeding towards her. It took place shortly after midnight. A drunk motorist swerved out in the shadows and struck Sarah, as she and a few of her companions crossed the roadway. She was launched into his automobile by the force of the collision and into the path of oncoming traffic. The motorist simply continued on. Jim Scantlin remembers that about midnight the phone rings and Betsy finally answered it. When she returned, she grabbed my big toe and commanded me to stand up. We must visit the hospital right now. A dreadful thing has happened to Sarah. I'll explain. I started awake that night and found myself in a terrifying nightmare of a new universe. The Scantlin's daughter, Sarah, the source of their joy and the hope of their world had passed away, and nothing could have prepared them for what they witnessed when they arrived at the hospital. The corpse of a young woman, still breathing, was all that face on the bed in front of them. Her skull was broken and her face was twisted. Her promising life had now been irreparably destroyed. Jim Scantlin remarks, I take one glance in there and it's simply horrific. She was struck by a juvenile drunk driver, thrown over into the path of another automobile, and that's the one that really got her, straight in the head, causing her to be horrifically mangled, especially in the brain. I was unable to manage it. Betsy Scanlon, his wife, adds, I told the nurses there to come get me when she wakes up tonight, and the doctor informed us that Sarah wouldn't be awakened tonight. Jim Scanlon goes on to say, The neurosurgeon led us to a spot where we could sit down and said, All right, everybody. Although I probably shouldn't have said anything, I believe your daughter will survive physically. He then begins to describe the nature of the head injury. I'll tell you right now that there was no hope. Sarah suffered a severe brain injury. 
She was only able to breathe on her own. There was almost no movement, no communication, and no way to even guess what she was thinking, assuming she was incapable of doing so. Months and years passed during her protracted days of stillness. Your emotional condition is similar to the day before a funeral, but you never get to attend the funeral and begin working through the process, claims Jim Scantlin. As the 1980s gave way to the 1990s, Sarah remained ensconced in her solitary existence. Jim, her older brother, who's adored her since the day she was born, noticed a weakening of their relationship. He says, I gave up hope a long, long time ago. There were times when it would get so grueling I would think that Sarah was dead, her father continues. However, at the beginning of this year, just as it appeared that Sarah was lost for good, a miracle event took place. The Scantlins received a call from the nursing home one Friday in February. Jim Scantlin declares, The speakerphone was on when Beth said, Someone wants to talk to you, getting emotional. It's Sarah, she said. And then I yelled, Sarah! And then she exclaimed, Hello! And I simply became numb. After that, I don't recall anything. Says Betsy Scantlin, Then I heard Jennifer yelling, Tell her what you want, from the back, in form of your desires. Sarah then says, I want makeup. According to Jim Scanlon, in an instant, I started to understand that she wasn't referring to Sarah. Speaking with Sarah was her. You want to talk to her, she asks, and I respond, sure. And when I answer the phone, I introduce myself as Dad. Hi, Dad, I love you. Readers still curious about Sarah Scantlin. A reader who works for the FBI wrote to inquire about Sarah Scantlin's cause of death. Given that Sarah passed very shortly after turning 50 due to respiratory problems and low blood pressure, we're assuming that this be a personal inquiry rather than an FBI inquiry. A piece was published in the Hutchinson News on June 2, 2016, one year after she passed away. After viewing the video, the reader claimed he was curious to learn more about Sarah. Recently, it was broadcast on Netflix, which sparked interest in Sarah's tale. For those who may not recall, Sarah Scantlin, who'd been living in a minimally conscious state for years, performed a medical miracle when she recovered her voice. Her awakening happened in 2005, when the woman who had endured 20 years of communication-impaired living suddenly started speaking. She was struck by the vehicle, who fled the scene, and her tragedy began in 1984, just a few weeks into her freshman year at Hutchinson Community College. Everyone was astounded that Sarah recalled her loved ones when she woke up. Her memory was long-term. Jim Scantlin, her brother, described it as eerie. She recalled everyone. She was aware of her friends and teachers. When I entered the room, she greeted me with a, Hi. He noted that Sarah's voice was fairly clear when speaking. She thought she was still 18 or 19, even though it had been 20 years. It never occurred to her in all those years that she was approaching 50. Jim said, You couldn't persuade her otherwise. She hardly ever questioned anything, but when she did, it always caught people off guard. That was her go-to query. Really? She responded that she didn't want to talk about the accident when Jim asked her whether she remembered it. No one could explain why she'd started speaking, leaving doctors perplexed. She was even highlighted in a 2007 special edition of Time magazine that explored the brain and the mysteries of consciousness. Well, friends, this is the end of this incredible story. We hope, as always, that it's been to your liking. If you liked it, give us a like, leave us your valuable comment, share on your social networks, subscribe to our channel, and activate the notification bell so that you're always notified when we have a new video, and in this way you won't miss any of our stories. For now, we only have to invite you to join us in the next one.